So my name is Julie Cusick. I am an engagement coordinator with Alberta Capital Airshed. If you are not familiar with Alberta Capital Airshed, we are a not-for-profit multi-stakeholder organization. Our members and board include representation from educational institutions, municipalities, government, industry, NGOs, and interested citizens. The air quality data we collect is reported to the public and is used to calculate the local air quality health index. You may know this as AQHI. We also provide outreach and educational initiatives to increase air quality awareness and address local issues. We are one of 10 airsheds in the province. Today's webinar is an encore presentation of April's Clean Air webinar, Connecting Air Quality Across Canada. We welcome back Patience Rikochi from Fraser Basin Council. Patience is joined by Christine Rigby from the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority and Michael Bizaga from Lakeland Industry and Community Association, also known as LICA. Each will provide a valuable insight into air quality work taking place in their local communities. Patients will speak about a recent study from UBC Advancing Air Quality and Climate Co-Benefits in the Prince George Airshed. Christine will speak about the air quality study the Port of Vancouver currently has in progress. And Michael Bizaga will present on the various activities LICA is involved in regarding air quality in the region. So thank you all of you for being here today as presenters for our webinar. And before we begin presentations, I'd like to acknowledge that Alberta Capital Airshed is on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of many First Nations, including the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux. We acknowledge that this territory is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta. Today, we honor the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit who have been on these lands since time immemorial by being thoughtful about the air we breathe and how we can work to ensure it is healthy and life-giving for our earth, the current generation and for many generations to come. I invite you to take a moment to consider the land and air from which you join us from today. So a bit about how this webinar will work. This webinar will take place for approximately 60 minutes. Each panelist will do a short presentation. After all the panelists are done their presentations, we will move into a short Q&A session. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box to put your question to the queue. I will then use that Q&A section to facilitate the Q&A that will happen following presentations. If you have a comment that you'd like to share, something that you think may be of interest to others who are on the webinar, please feel free to use the comment box. This is about building community around air quality across the country, and we invite you to use the comment box in a respectful way. So with that, on to our first presentation. Welcome ba back, patients. If you didn't catch Patience's presentation at our April 4th Clean Air webinar, you can view a recording of that on our website at capitalairshed.ca under Education and Outreach Webinars. Patience was brought on board as the General Manager of the Prince George Air Improvement Roundtable, also known as PG Air, to support the members of which are working to achieve desired air quality targets for the region. She manages all the affairs of the roundtable, including budgets, special committees, community presence, and events coordination. She is currently working in collaboration with other regional air quality managers to realize efficiencies and design projects that reach a broad, broader audience. She is also in the process of developing a new air quality management plan with members of PGO. So with that, patience, uh, go ahead, microphone over to you. Yes, yes, so thank you very much again for allowing me to I'm really presenting on behalf of the crew from UBC that um, that I was working with for this project. Uh, and, and this was uh, Vanessa, Nathan and Melissa who worked very, very hard. Um, and this was one of their, um, from, from a presentation that they did to our board back last January and they were acknowledging their traditional territory from where they were down in the Vancouver area, uh, area the Musqueam, uh, Salo Tooth and uh, um, Squamish people, and I'm presenting today from the traditional territory of the Klitli Tene, and that's where the project was conducted. But I, I want to make sure that I let everybody know that I am kind of presenting on their behalf because they've uh, graduated from the master's program and uh, in the 
Masters of Community and Regional uh, Planning, and they are off doing wonderful things in the world. So they weren't able to do this, and so they said I could. <laughs> anyway, um, we, you know, addressing air quality and climate change uh, simultaneously, this was, this was the premise that um, it could provide environmental and socioeconomic uh, benefits. And we saw this as an opportunity to identify actions um, that offer co-benefits between air quality and climate change. And it really started around funding and access to funding because so many pockets of funding nowadays are uh, enveloped in that uh, cl climate change piece. And, and as we, and people that are involved in air quality, we know like as the climate gets warmer and as, 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 as climate is changing, our air quality is also being impacted. So it's right there along with it, but it's not always recognized. So we really saw this as an opportunity to highlight some of the actions, simply put, that we could be taking that would definitely benefit um, climate change, but um, also air quality. So in partnership with the SCARP studio to UBC, um, that's the direct direction that we took. Um, and uh, uh, I guess the, the thought was, is that this material would uh, provide input into our upcoming air quality management plan, which we've actually changed to an air shed management plan. We figured that was a little bit more encompassing. So there was there was lots of challenges. And and one of the challenges, of course, is is understanding the the jurisdiction around air quality. You know, there's definitely federal federal standards. There's provincial um, different responsibilities at those governmental levels. And then, of course, down to the local and the regional. And it it really varies in terms of what um, what capacity those those government entities have. So determining an organization's ability to create change based on um, jurisdictional authority is an important first step when you're assessing um, possible action plans towards approving air quality because you might propose things that just can't be done at the local level. But uh, these guys did an, an excellent job and I, I my presentation is is not really long um, today. I think it's pretty I've kept it pretty succinct because the concept really is is what I've just just described to you. Um, but local government does play an essential role in implementing and monitoring actions that influence both climate change and air quality. Um, lim as I said, limited funding and budget constraints are challenges for every local government across Canada. And by highlighting the multiple benefits of taking action that improves air quality while also mitigating and adapting um, climate change um, at the um, provincial and federal level for finance programs, um, we could apply this at the local level in the community. So that was the context of this project. Um, yeah, yeah, we saw an opportunity to identify actions um, that benefit both of these. Um, air quality and climate change are closely linked, um, stemming from the fact that air pollutants and greenhouse gases are often derived from the same sources, uh, predominantly fossil fuel combustion. Uh, methane and black carbon contribute both to air pollution and climate change as well. Um, therefore, reducing all those emissions um, benefit climate change and air quality. There, there was a lot of work done on some of these on these pollutants, but I'm not going to go into those details today. I think we have a, a grasp of of the idea of um, greenhouse gases and and air and air quality uh, emissions. <clears throat> uh, the overarching objective of this project uh, was to provide the Prince George Air Improvement Roundtable in the city of Prince George and the regional district of Fraser Fort George, so all the local governments that are at the Prince George Air Improvement Roundtable, um, with uh, strategic direction in, to advance air quality and climate change goals um, and to benefit the upcoming airshed plan. Step one, oops, uh, step one was to compile um, comprehensive database existing, <clears throat> sorry, of existing uh, related act, sorry, of existing actions related to air quality by reviewing each of those organizations' uh, existing plans. So um, the regional district has um, has plans, but a recent agricultural uh, uh, study in the Prince George, um, city of Prince George has a occupational, uh, or sorry, an official community plan. So plans like that, that have pieces within them that address air quality. So the students spent quite a bit of time going through existing documents from all the organizations and, and compiling uh, that information. Then they assess the gaps and opportunities to advance air quality by um, interviewing the parties of those, of uh, the interested parties, and then comparing plans with outside organizations. That was all part of the step two. And then in step three, um, they provided our member organizations with strategic direction um, by identifying those actions um, that relate air quality and climate change. 
this is a little bit blurry. I, I, I will admit, I admit that I kind of copied and pasted this um, from the fi our final report so that I could sort of frame it. And this really is the three-step process. The, uh, the six-step process on that wheel was adapted from um, uh, Silverstein and, and Bartonova. It's a 2012 study that looks at uh, the steps that are involved in an air quality management plan. And then they sort of work their project around that. So they would fill in the gaps based on what would be required for an air quality management plan. <clears throat> so the objective of phase two uh, was to further scope down the existing actions identified in phase one. So phase one was again, that real, that data, data collection to reveal the sectors that offer the most benefits for both climate change and air quality. Phase two also intended to assess gaps and opportunities for improving air quality management in the Prince George airshed by reviewing comparable plans to determine what other like governments or organizations within Western Canada were doing to, um, to manage air quality. Uh, they did a, a comparative analysis to identify climate change and air quality co-benefits um, to determine the highest contributing greenhouse gas sectors within the city of Prince George. So they got, they drilled down and got quite specific for our area. They examined in emissions inventory from 2020 that the city of Prince George did and had in their climate mitigation plan. Um, and so given, and given, I, I'll caveat that, but given the the project scope, they only focused on the community emissions um, that had an overall influence on the city and within the airshed. And then to determine the highest contributing, so that's the greenhouse gas emission piece, and then to determine the highest contributing sectors of air pollutants in the Prince George, they looked at the Prince George air emissions, um, micro emissions inventory. <laughs> Pardon me, morning here, uh, PM 2.5, um, uh, NOx and SO2 within the airshed, so and PM10 as well. So particulate matter um, it is a big concern here. Um, the comparative analysis identified transportation, um, industry, and buildings as the most significant contributing sectors to both greenhouse gases and air pollutants, like PM2.5. Um, so therefore, the project assumed that these three sectors would offer the greatest co-benefits for air, advancing air quality and climate change. And they didn't rank the sectors in order of importance um, because of the jurisdictional uh, matters when it comes to those three areas. So yeah, transportation, residential buildings, industry and commercial buildings um, were the top three contributors um, overlapping in those two uh, areas. The objective of, th of phase three was to provide uh, PG Air with um, strategic direction by identifying proposed actions. So they went um, from they got the big moves and I'm going to show you those in a moment so they they identified uh, a number of big moves and then they had actions that would fill in for those big moves and then they provided examples um, for each for each of those so this next slide shows um, the big moves so these were our 10 big moves um, encouraging active transportation developing options for trip reduction accelerated uptake of electric vehicles um, all the green circles are related to transportation all the, the two orange circles are related to industry and the blue are related to uh, buildings and infrastructure. So that gives you an idea that this is the this is the big move piece. And then so each each one of those big moves, um, they provided uh, a timeline for accomplishing that. Uh, they suggested the lead organization that could uh, best take that big move on whether it was the city, the regional district, you know, whether there was assistance needed from the province, et cetera. Uh, they provided examples, as I said, um, they had reference documents, uh, whether it was external references or references with, with, within house. Um, and they also um, provided us with opportunities for funding where they could find it. So that was really handy too, because they were kind of on the, um, they were out there and scoping around. So they were seeing uh, opportunities that we were necessarily coming across our plate. So. Um, this is an, this is an, I just pulled this out as uh, one of the big moves around the transportation. So the, those are the big moves I was reading to you, those develop options for trip reduction, increased fuel efficiencies, et cetera. I won't read the screen to you, um, but we distilled that down into um, continuing with this example. Um, so trip reduction one, encourage carpooling or, or offer work related transportation and some texts and context around that, you know, providing the lead organization and a timeline and they had short, mid and long-term. So those 
actions through their research that they felt or discovered through conversations with the various entities too that could be accomplished in the short term they tagged it that way and then um, things that needed a midterm or a longer term they were able to put that context into each one of these as well and as I said they um, they also provided uh, funding opportunities and and what they learned about those funding opportunities for each one of these so it was really handy and the next one is, is the next slide is a bit of a mess, but I copied this right from uh, they provided me a huge workbook. Uh, and it's just an Excel workbook, not just <laughs> it is an Excel workbook with a number of tabs across the bottom that it each that address each one of the sectors. And this is sort of this is I just copied and pasted this out um, so that you could see what it looks like. Um, they've got the reference documents, the actual big move um, proposed actions, and then they have coded everything. Uh, and then examples around that, whether it was existing, like from a plan that hadn't been advanced. So it ne not necessarily a new idea. Some of it was just drawing attention to it and, and pointing out that if you do this, you're going to benefit greenhouse gas emis emissions and reduce those as well as bettering your air quality, the type of action, the sector, and then all the reference material was, was numbered. So uh, that last column is just some numbers. So that in a nutshell was uh, was a very long project. It took almost a year um, of their time, and it was really great to work with those kids. And I, you know, anybody that's, um, you know, um, Christine, you might be familiar with the SCARP program. <laughs> Christine's one of the or the next presenter, but anybody that's familiar with the SCARP program and has a project and really would like to um, like assistance with that project, I encourage you to scope scope that out at, at UBC. Um, it's, I, I, we had a great experience. Uh, the kids are really great to work with. So I think air quality is always a matter for continuous improvement, especially as we're in a changing climate. I just, I wanna thank you again for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, that's, that's my presentation. Wonderful, thank you, Patience. Uh, it's great to hear a bit more about that that project. I know that was of keen interest at our last webinar. So thank you for providing that context on behalf of the the folks who put together the the research there and and for your part in that. Thank, and I'm happy I'm happy to talk and share. You know, if somebody wanted to contact me, you can share pieces of it or or whatever that looks like because I think it should it should be shared across the country because I mean, like I said, not it might not be new, but you might think of it with a different light. So yeah, absolutely. And we can certainly post that to our website along with the webinar recording if you'd like to have it posted there as well. Great. So on to our next presenter, Christine Rigby has worked in the air quality and climate change field for 22 years, the last 18 of 18 of which have been spent leading air quality programs for the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority in Vancouver, Canada. At the Port Authority, Christine's focus is on local, regional, and international collaboration and the development and implementation of emission reduction policies and initiatives that emphasize flexible, results-based approaches. Prior to joining the Port Authority, Christine spent four years with the British Columbia Ministry of Environment working on air quality related issues. So with that, Christine, welcome. Thank you for being here today and for telling us a little bit more about the study you have uh, going on right now. Over to you. Good morning, everybody. I'm happy to chat with you today about our Strathcona Area Air Quality Study. Forward. So the Strathcona neighborhood, for anyone who's not familiar with Vancouver, is a near port community. It's located right next to downtown Vancouver. Um, and so it's also right next to a number of our port terminals along the south shore of Burrard Inlet. It also has a port road and rail network uh, that is either adjacent to or in some cases travels through the neighborhood. So there's a lot of interfaces between port um, as well as general activity in the city and this community. The Strathcona Area Air Quality Study is a two-year monitoring study. Um, and it's designed to measure and assess air quality both in and around the Strathcona area to try and identify uh, areas for potential improvement. The study is actually a follow-up to a survey done by the Strathcona Residents Association in 2021, uh, where they asked community residents and businesses for their experiences with air quality in the neighborhood. Uh, the Vancouver Fraser, Fraser Port Authority is funding the study. Uh, and this photo on the on the right that you see here uh, is a Metro Vancouver regulatory monitoring station. It's a near roadside station um, in the middle of Vancouver. 
Um, and we have uh, done some co-location for our monitors. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, but um, some of our monitors are co-located here and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. So the study is guided by a steering committee. Um, the steering committee is co-chaired by the Strathcona Residents Association and Vancouver Fraser Port Authority. And then we have technical members from the University of British Columbia, Metro Vancouver, Vancouver Coastal Health, the City of Vancouver, and Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, again, this is a photo of one of the monitors. It's located on the roof of a preschool near the port, and you can see some of the container terminal equipment in the background. Community engagement is a really important part of the study. It's, it, it is an air quality study, but we also really wanted to make sure that we involve the community as much as possible. And, and that was something that was also really important to the Strathcona Residents Association. Um, we're working through our engagement process to build awareness and understanding of current air quality within, within the area. Um, and I'll again, get into that, how we're doing that with this study in, in a couple more slides. Um, we wanna be able to share the results of the study both in real time where we can and also through reporting. We're also working to create opportunities for the community to engage with the steering committee. Uh, and we do that through public events. Um, and I'll talk about those in a moment too. Uh, and also getting community feedback and input into the study. And the Strathcona Residents Association is really uh, facilitating that. And then just communicating the benefits of why it's important to better characterize and understand what's impacting air quality in different locations. So the approach that we've taken to meeting those objectives, we have a project website and I'll have a link to that at the end of the deck. We have various communication materials, uh, frequently asked questions document, fact sheets and key messages. Those have all been developed jointly with the steering committee. We also have a newsletter, um, social media outreach and uh, survey. Um, and we've been hosting information sessions. The photos at the bottom there are of the most recent Celebrate Strathcona event that the Strathcona Residents Association organizes. It's a big community event in, in a very large park in, in the neighborhood. And there's all kinds of different booths and we have a tent and um, ourselves, the Residents Association and members of the steering committee um, will attend and, and speak to residents and, and share with them information about the study. So developing a study like this, this is not something that we've done before, and it's not something that anyone on our steering committee has done before. Um, so it's a bit of a learning process as we go. There's all kinds of different steps involved. Um, so we started off with identifying uh, what the issues were and what the pollutants of concern were. Uh, we settled on particulate matter, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and then black carbon, specifically as an indicator of diesel particulate matter. Then we had to map out the, the, the neighborhood. Um, what were the key areas of monitoring? And I'll talk uh, in a minute about what, what sort of factors went into deciding where we wanted to monitor. The next big step was to identify and purchase the monitors that we were going to use. Um, we really needed to understand how air quality varied in this community uh, because of the various sources that it has. So we needed to have multiple monitors. Um, and what that means is it really rules out regulatory monitoring. They're expensive and, and difficult to get installed. Um, then we had to identify specific monitoring sites. So we knew what areas we wanted to monitor in, you know, like a block kind of thing, but we needed to actually find places to put the monitors. So uh, the Strathcona Residents Association was really integral to helping work with community members and businesses to to find people who were willing to host monitors. The next step was getting agreements in place with those monitoring hosts, really just laying out, you know, that we, that, that it is an air quality monitoring study. Uh, we'd really like to avoid things like smoking or barbecues near the monitors. Um, and, and so that was a, an important step for us. Then we went through a co-location step. So in that first photograph, I noted that that was a regulatory monitoring station that Metro Vancouver operates. So we co-located all of our monitors for 30 days at that location to get them set up. And then we've, we're keeping one of each kind of monitor at the location for the duration of the study to continue to make sure that these monitors that we're using are um, comparable, uh, reasonably comparable to the regulatory grade monitors. Then we went through deploying the monitors throughout the community. We have our consultant, WSP has been, do, been doing that for us. 
And then we have our two year data collection period, which for this study uh, was from January of this year to the end of December of next year. Reporting out on results, um, I'll again provide uh, a little bit more on that later on. Some of the results we'll be able to share real time. It'll be raw data, um, so it will need to be uh, corrected. Uh, and then we'll have detailed reports with, with corrected data as well. And then engaging with the community throughout. Um, the three main events that have happened so far uh, include two of the Strathcona, Celebrate Strathcona events, 2022 and 2023. And then the Strathcona Residents Association held a community air quality forum last fall as well that, that we were able to participate in. So this is a map of the neighborhood. Um, there's the, the blow up just gives you a little bit uh, more of a refined view. Um, the water area, the blue at the top, those are all, that's the port. Um, so there are two container terminals, some grain terminals, a sugar terminal, and some, and, and not too far uh, to the west is our cruise terminal. Um, so you can see that the, the community is very close to some major marine terminals. Um, going along the east-west boundary to the north of the community um, is our road and rail network where we would have container trucks moving as well as trains. And then on um, just sort of towards the eastern edge of the community, there's uh, another road and rail network as well. So those are all of the different monitoring locations. We have quite a few. In the end, we're going, we're, we're, we're striving for 18 different locations in this neighborhood. And again, like I mentioned earlier, it's not a, it's not an approach that we've taken before, but we really wanted to understand how air quality varied throughout the neighborhood. We decided on where to put the monitors uh, based on a combination of technical input from the technical members of the committee, as well as community um, experience with air quality and community perception of air quality. Um, the monitors are, are generally placed near sensitive receptors. Um, so things like schools, senior centers, daycares, social housing, parks, and playgrounds. Um, we also have monitors that are located near both the trucking routes as well as the rail routes um, and near port, port facilities, and also took into account the prevailing winds as well. So as I mentioned, we're not using regulatory monitors. Um, regulatory monitors are very expensive and very difficult to uh, site and install. They've got specific requirements of where, you know, where they can be relative to buildings and trees and things like that. Um, and uh, just as an example, a uh, number of years ago, eight or nine years ago, we had provided funding to uh, Metro Vancouver to put in a regulatory monitor in this neighborhood and they have still been having trouble um, getting permission to put it in. So just to, just to, to get a sense of how challenging that can be. On the flip side, what we call um, emerging smaller sensor technologies that are lower cost are really easy to install. They're very small. They don't have the same sighting requirements. In some cases, um, they don't even require electrical. They're, they're solar powered. Um, so much, much easier to deploy. And you can see sort of the, si the sense of them. I mean, it's kind of handheld size monitors. Um, so what we have is a purple air monitor, and these will be used to monitor particulate matter. Um, clarity monitors will monitor both particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide. And we have passive sulfur dioxide sampling. On the black carbon front, uh, we had purchased five um, observe air monitors that were going to measure black carbon as well as continuous sulfur dioxide and carbon monoxide. Um, we spent a couple of months working with those monitors and with the vendor. Um, there were a number of issues with them and in, in the end, uh, um, we found out with the vendor's help that there was an irresolvable issue that the vendor, had. none of the monitors will work going forward. So we've had to return those and are sort of back to some of our initial research on black carbon monitoring, likely looking at the use of one or more microethylometers uh, for this pollutant. By having these low and lower cost monitors, we get that really dense monitoring network. So you can really get a sense for how that air quality varies throughout the neighborhood. So these are some of the, uh, just a couple screenshots. The purple air and the clarity data are both available online real time. Um, and on the project website, there are links and instructions for how to access that data. Um, it's, un, uh, it's unverified, not, no QA or QC on, on the data. And because of the way these monitors work, they do require some correction factors that are based on um, 
that co-location at the beginning and the ongoing co-location of, of a single monitor of each type throughout the study. Um, so uh, you can certainly use the real-time uh, data, but just bear in mind that it, it will need to be adjusted somewhat. Um, but just to give you a sense of the fact that you can go on at any time and take a look at the monitors. Um, for both of these uh, types of monitors, when you go into the Clarity or the Purple Air site, you'll see all kinds of monitors. And the monitors for our community study um, will have our acronym SAAQS at the beginning of the name to help people narrow down on it. We'll also be doing uh, formal reporting on the study for all of the pollutants. And at that point, the, the, the data would be assessed for data completeness, quality control, those algorithms would be applied to correct any data that's necessary. Um, we'll be comparing them to reference monitoring data, uh, both within the community, that near roadside station, as well as in other neighborhoods in the region, and also comparing them to ambient air quality objectives. Um, correlating it with meteorology, things like wind speed, wind direction, and taking a look at the variation um, over time and space within the community. Uh, we'll also be comparing it with port activity, uh, things like truck and rail traffic, construction, operation at the terminals, and then really trying to use all of that to address the study objectives. So a study like this uh, is definitely uh, not one that comes without its challenges. And, and so I've tried to get a little sense here for, for anyone that's interested in doing something like this. We've learned a lot along the way. Um, it's definitely taken a lot more time and, and patience and collaboration. But I think uh, what, we're, what we're coming out with is a, is a really solid approach to a study. Um, finding reliable, easy to deploy and within budget monitoring technologies that also provide reasonable results was the first big hurdle for our study. Um, again, we, we wanted to have more than one monitor. We wanted to be able to get those monitors out for a two year period. So we needed to find technologies that would actually work. And so our steering committee and their technical um, background was really important uh, for us to doing that um, because I'm not a monitoring expert. I'm not a technology expert, um, but we have a lot of really knowledgeable people on our committee that were able to help with that. We also had technical difficulties with a number of the monitors. I already shared a little bit of the issues that we had with the observe air monitors. We had some problems with our purple air monitors. They also had a faulty component that our consultant noted uh, and had to reach out to purple air, return all of the monitors and get new ones back. So they have to really be on top of watching the data to make sure that things are working properly throughout the study. Um, and then we've also had some issues with clarity that have had to be corrected. And, um, we we discovered some of those in in our reporting phase, so it meant going back and re re um, evaluating the data and moving forward from there. Nothing insurmountable, but definitely things that that come up that need to be dealt with. Um, we also needed various contracts and agreements to get the monitors deployed, and um, uh, generally those aren't an issue. But when we have a a large entity like uh, the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority. Um, working with uh, community members and small businesses to, to put monitors in place, striking that balance between a legal agreement that an organization like ours would be most comfortable with, um, with something that's uh, accessible to uh, someone who doesn't have a, a team of lawyers is also something that we had to, had to consider and, and approach. Um, lots of different viewpoints and feedback on the study. Uh, throughout, you know, in terms of where to site monitors, there was some alignment, but also some differing opinions, um, mostly when it came to reporting, um, what level of detail, some people wanted more detail, some people wanted less detail. Um, so a lot of different balancing of different views was was important there. Um, our approach to engagement was another thing uh, we had uh, been moving forward with one approach to engagement and uh, probably about six months in, realized that that wasn't <clears throat> really working for, for the Strathcona Residents Association. So we actually paused on our engagement so that we could take some time to loop back with them and, and find an approach that, that worked for, for them as, as well as the rest of the steering committee. And you probably won't know this unless you've seen presentations by the Port of Vancouver before, but you'll see in my background um, that red banner across the top. So that's one of our primary colors that we use. Um, and in the deck here, you'll see um, green across the top and the Strathcona Residents Association logo along the bottom. So we've, we've worked really hard to make sure that we're using more neutral 
coloring so that it's uh, more branded to uh, to show that it's a, a joint effort and not just a Vancouver Fraser Port Authority effort. Um, I've already talked about the level of detail for reporting. Um, really managing expectations is another one. Um, we have a very clearly defined scope, terms of reference, all of that kind of thing, but we we need to periodically go back and revisit those because as we get further away from when we developed those, we get into getting some data and people get excited about what they're seeing. Um, we start to get scope creep um, where people start saying, oh, let's add this or let's do that too. And, and that can really affect um, the budget and the timelines for the study. Um, so trying to, to manage those expectations is important. And then just lastly, and sort of underlying all of these challenges in the study is building that trust. The Strathcona Residents Association um, came to us with concerns about port impacts on air quality in their community. And we wanted to respond to that. And we wanted to make sure that we had the technical experts with us to support us on that. Um, but it still requires, uh, you know, working together and, and finding ways to build that trust. And I'll just end with uh, a couple of links here on my final slide. The first link is to the Strathcona Residents Association Air Quality Project. And there's some information on the study on, on their website, as well as some of their other work that they're doing on air quality. And then the last link there is the project website where you'll find uh, direct links to the real-time um, uh, monitoring data for the purple airs and the clarities. And that is it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Christine. I've got a bunch of questions marked down for our Q&A uh, session of the webinar. Thank you for, for telling us about your project and, and about how you went building it and, and carrying it forward. So I've got a bit of a commercial break here. If you're enjoying this webinar, we invite you to view past recordings in the Clean Air webinar series by heading to capitalairshed.ca, um, and you can find those under the uh, resources and engagement tab. And we're always happy to connect with air quality organizations across the country. So if you are part of an air quality organization or you know of one and you want to learn more about what they do, let me know. I'm happy to connect with them and put together a webinar based on topics that are of interest to those who come to our webinar series. You can reach me at jkusiek at capitalairshed.ca. Thanks. Michael is going to join us next as our next presenter. Michael Bazaga is currently working for Lakeland, Ind Lakeland Industry and Community Association, also known as LICA. He is their monitoring programs manager, a role which he has had since 2006. He grew up in Toronto and completed his undergraduate degree at the University of Waterloo's Faculty of Environmental Studies. He has spent much of his career in the air monitoring field working with airshed organizations and focuses on data interpretation and visualization, mapping, monitoring plan development and air quality education. Michael currently lives in Richmond, BC and is completing a master's degree in geomatics at UBC. So with that, Michael, we're, we're looking forward to having you here and telling us a bit more about Leica. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, so before I begin my, uh... My talk. I just wanted to do a, a, the territory, territorial acknowledgement for the area that Leica operates in. Leica recognizes that our operational boundary falls within the traditional lands of the Dene, Cree, and Métis. This recognition uh, represents uh, respect and gratitude towards sharing the land and honors our responsibility to truth and reconciliation as members of Treaty 6, 8, uh, and 10 territory and the Métis homeland. So um, in, just to give an overview of, of what LICA does, um, I, I've kind of divided my presentation into these uh, kind of seven, uh, seven um, uh, topics. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, each of them throughout, um, uh, throughout, throughout this uh, presentation. So just uh, about LICA. Uh, LICA is many things. LICA is a, a synergy group. Um, in synergy groups in Alberta aim to uh, achieve positive positive uh, outcomes through uh, shared learning, communications, and and resources, um, and they excel at connecting diverse individuals from many different organizations. Uh, where Leica is also an airshed zone, um, and I'll be talking quite a bit about that. Um, and 
I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but uh, air sheds primarily monitor air quality, um, you know, adhering to the air monitoring directive, and we uh, am, and we have a, a place-based monitoring uh, program that addresses the needs of the stakeholders in our region. And like is also a WPAC or a watershed planning and advisory council for the Beaver River watershed. Um, and uh, the WPAC uh, aims to harmonize um, ecological values and, and with a sustainable economy uh, for a thriving community. It aligns with uh, Alberta's uh, water for life strategy uh, to guarantee water for future generations. Uh, LICA is a multi-stakeholder organization uh, made up of uh, many different representatives from different sectors, including community, uh, agriculture, Métis, First Nations industry, as well as um, as uh, different um, government uh, agencies, including the Energy Regulator and Alberta Environment. Uh, our mission, vision, and values. Our, mi our vision is that the environment in the Leica region is ecologically healthy and sustainable. And our, our mission is that Leica collects, shares, acts upon credible data, indigenous knowledge, and information relevant to the environment. Uh, this will be achieved through scientific study, community engagement, and meaningful partnerships. And I'll be talking quite a bit about the, on the, the collects, shares, and acts upon credible data part in my presentation. Uh, so our, our monitoring network, uh, we are one of 10 airsheds in the province, as Julie you know, mentioned in, uh, in the uh, beginning of, of, uh, of this webinar. Um, now there are 10 airsheds in the province, and each, each one of those is a member of the Alberta Airsheds Council, and LICA values this you know, membership in the council as uh, a way to you know, provide uh, um, input to policy de decisions, share best practices, and provide training opportunities to up upskill our, our, our teams for better monitoring and, and responsiveness. Um, you know, in essence, our collaborative approach ensures that each airshed um, addresses its unique local concerns, but all um, but through collaboration through the uh, Airsheds Council, uh, we're all moving towards a kind of a common outcome of a shared outcome or a value of good air quality and reduced air quality data for Alberta and Albertans. And in terms of our local monitoring network, um, in this map, it shows a, a multi multiple uh, shades and colors and shapes to, to identify the kinds of the different kinds of monitoring that LICA does. Uh, our approach is multifaceted. Um, we use continuous monitoring, passive monitoring, sensor-based monitoring, some of those you've heard about from the other presenters. Um, we also have integrated sampling. We also do some effects-based sampling too, where we're looking at the effects of so uh, the effects of air quality and deposition on soil. Um, and, and acid sensitive lakes. And um, a couple of the little figures or graphics that you see on this slide also are, are, are except excerpts from our um, organizational report card that we uh, prepare uh, every year. And this the report card covers not just air quality, but, all, but also outcomes of the, of the watershed and, and on our education and outreach um, initiatives. Uh, so just to visualize some of uh, some of those methods, we use uh, continuous monitoring, uh, and we have four continuous AQHI capable um, monitoring stations in our network. Uh, three of those were fixed, and one of those is portable, which I'll talk about. I'll talk about a special study, I suppose, uh, later on in this presentation, in which we used our portable monitoring station. We we have a um, kind of extensive passive monitoring network where we're monitoring uh, sulfur dioxide. Ozone, so um, H2S, uh, nitric acid, ammonia, uh, to support our acid deposition monitoring program. We also have time integrated monitoring, um, sensor based monitoring in some smaller communities, and we're investigating um, other technologies in addition to purple air, which is what you're looking at in that photo to um, increase the number of parameters for monitoring. And as I mentioned, we also have some soil and acid, soil acidification and acid sensitive lakes monitoring as well. And a growing um, component of our regional monitoring network includes uh, precipitation chemistry and deposition monitoring. So um, our organization is like deeply committed to making air quality monitoring data both accessible uh, and comprehensive. 
Uh, and we try to use different kinds of visualizations to to achieve um, uh, achieve that that goal. And you know, transitioning from our broad monitoring network to some more kind of immediate concerns, this slide underscores uh, the very real and pressing challenges that that we face this year for anyone who ventured outdoors or or simply looked out the window. This was kind of evident. We had an incredibly smoky uh, and intensely smoky summer this year. So some of these are some of the headlines. Uh, that we uh, saw in local uh, local and national uh, news outlets. And this is a visualization of our four AQHI capable monitoring stations for the air quality health index of so each dot on one of those um, um, uh, uh, charts that represents a one hour um, AQHI risk value. So as you can see, we had multiple periods this past summer at throughout the, throughout our region where uh, the air quality health index was at the very high or high risk or very high risk um, uh, uh, level. We also spend a lot of time uh, visualizing our our monitoring data in um, in in maps. Um, this is our passive monitoring uh, data from 2022 and uh, there's some kind of nice patterns here in terms of what we're looking at. We see kind of an inverse relationship between our ozone and nitrogen dioxide concentrations. The darker the shades of the color, the higher the, con the higher concentrations they represent. Our sul the sulfur dioxide map kind of tells us what we expect, that this is where most of the oil sands operations are in our region, uh, and they're the primary source of sulfur dioxide. So we see that in, the, in, that, in that, uh, that, that area as well. And then, in uh, for hydrogen sulfide again, hydrogen sulfide from oil sands facilities is a uh, is a uh, is something we expect to see. But there's a bit of a, a smudge uh, that you'll see over a uh, Bonneville as well, which I'll talk about later. Uh, we did some monitoring around uh, a particularly smelly lake in uh, in Bonneville. This is another uh, data visualization that we've uh, developed. We call it air quality uh, DNA visualization. And it kind of looks like if you're into murder uh, mystery shows where they're you know, profiling a DNA sequence, kind of looks like that, but it's, it's, it has nothing to do with, with uh, D, uh, DNA. Uh, it just it resembles one of those DNA sequences. And what this does is we are able to use uh, our continuous monitoring data to kind of uh, tease out seasonal uh, or spatial patterns in, in the monitoring data. So on this chart, this is nitrogen dioxide for a different, few different monitoring stations in Alberta, Cold Lake being one, being one of our monitoring stations and Red Deer and Edmonton South being uh, stations in other monitoring networks. So in, in this chart, for example, the darker slices are, each slice represents a one hour me measurement and the darker darker uh, color or darker shades represent higher concentration. So there's both a seasonal pattern that we can see here where it's higher in the winter time and lower in the summer. Um, and then there's also a spatial pattern where overall Edmonton sees higher concentrations of nitrogen dioxide than, than cold lake throughout the year. And a similar idea here, we can do a, a, a visualization use of, of using our DNA um, charts uh, with ozone, where we see the this is a typical pattern that we see in the prairies, where there's a pulse of higher concentrations in in the springtime. However, at Le in Lethbridge, just because of elevation and proximity to to mountains uh, and um, we'll see higher concentrations of ozone throughout the year. Um, for, compared to some of the other uh, locations in Alberta. And we've applied this visualization to air quality health index monitoring as well. So again, this is multiple monitoring stations across the um, across the province uh, for um, uh, 2019. And um, a couple of thing patterns start to emerge uh, in if you look at this monitoring data, uh, I think, uh, 2019 was the first time we may have heard the term polar vortex, uh, and what we were seeing here is elevated concentrations um, uh, during that polar vortex when uh, temperatures were really cold. There was elevated um, particulate matter um, in uh, province-wide during the Chalkade Creek wildfire, which was a fire that happened north of Peace River. And then unusually, and unusual, uh, we had a very uh, we had very few forest fire episodes that summer. Uh, so we had a um, you know, very low risk air quality health index values throughout the summer of 2019. Uh, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about the our um, Bonneville air quality monitoring study. 
Uh, so if you've ever traveled through Bonneville, um, you'll in, at certain times of the year there's a there's a smell, uh, and there was no secret about what the, where the smell was coming from. But there was it, there's a lake, a shallow lake, a typical prairie slough uh, that was shallow, and and this there's a kind of an H2S pulse in the spring being. Uh, um, that would that would happen when the ice thawed and um, H2S that was trapped under the ice is then released. Um, and then throughout the summer, algae blooms and whatnot uh, and decaying vegetation continued to drive the, those eight production of H2S, uh, which could very easily be smelled. Um, uh, so we moved our portable monitoring station to Bonneville to gather some data for that project. Um, and in these two videos here, one is the the, the left side is uh, shows some of the the issues around Jesse Lake. There's an inundated shoreline, lots of uh, kind of dead and rotting vegetation, um, and um, and a floating vegetation mat. Um, when we released the initial findings of our report for, for for monitoring in Bonneville, we had a lot of people tell us, "Oh no, no, it's not the lake; it's the sewage lagoons." Uh, so we 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 moved our monitoring station closer to the sewage lagoons as a follow up to the 2016-17 study, and while uh, these two charts here try to visualize that some of that data, each dot represents a one hour average concentration of hydrogen sulfide. So there's definitely a diurnal pattern at Jesse Lake, uh, higher in the evening, uh, lower during the day, uh, you know, stagnant temperatures overnight. And the Charlotte Lake or the Sewage Lagoon location, similar pattern, uh, however, more um, more pr more pronounced, I suppose. Um, we were a little bit closer to the Sewage Lagoons than we were to Jesse Lake. There was also a seasonal pattern that we observed. So Jesse Lake um, had high concentrations in the summer and lower in the winter. However, Charlotte Lake near the Sewage Lagoons, the Sewage Lagoons never really freeze over. Uh, so there's an extended period of these L hydro uh, high hydrogen sulfide concentrations. And um, the, the red dotted line here rep on these charts represents the one hour uh, objective for hydrogen sulfide, so multiple exceedances. Um, and then just some help, just a, an additional visualization here um, where we took, looked at um, the meteorology um, that we saw a definite pattern in terms of where that inundated shoreline was and where we were seeing those elevated concentration. Again, the dots, uh, high, the darker colors represent high concentrations. And 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 so in, in Jesse Lake, we're definitely seeing this high, the higher concentrations from these inundated shorelines and then the sh near Charlotte Lake from the sewage lagoons. What we didn't see, though, is um, we didn't see concentrations coming from uh, the other source if we're monitoring at the other location. So kind of depending on where you are in Bonneville, you're going to smell H2S. It might be from a different source. It could be the lake or it could be the sewage lagoons. And then a real quick last uh, kind of wrap up profile here. Um, something that's uh, something that's new to our monitoring network is adding acid deposition monitoring. Uh, there's been an increase in sulfur dioxide emissions in the region and change in policy, kind of driving the need to develop a strategy to monitor SO uh, acid deposition. Uh, so uh, we worked with uh, a number of different stakeholders to develop a, a strategy. Some of these these maps here present uh, kind of the things that we use to inform a monitoring strategy. We use our own monitoring, uh, the federal government's kind of super powered modeling um, for sulfur dioxide. And then this, this chart here shows MPRI emissions where we see that SO2 emissions are actually increasing from the different oil sands facilities in our region. Additionally, we, we this chart is just a linear trend, but uh, these the blue line represents passive monitoring stations within 20 kilometers of an oil fans facility and the green is um, outside of 20 kilometers. And there's a, there's, there, there is a pattern of increasing concentrations at those sites that are closer to oil sands facilities. So uh, we've been working towards implementing an asset deposition monitoring program to kind of quantify the, the effects of that. And lastly, uh, our special uh, kind of Things that we're particularly proud of is we get to we get to um, interface and and do out seminars with some of the local sec post secondary institutions, including uh, Blue Quills, which is a former residential school that has been reclaimed as a post secondary institution uh, for um, 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 funded by um, 
uh, different in First Nations in the area, and we delivered the air quality monitoring, the five-day air quality monitoring component for their community-based environmental monitoring program. And then looking ahead, um, we're going to continue our on, uh, ongoing implementation of our asset deposition monitoring program. We're going to expand the use of our low-cost sensors to small population centers and in Indigenous communities. Um, is there real, going to be a real focus over the next year on quality assurance, uh, both in internal, both internal and external reviews? And we're also working with St. Francis Xavier Methane, uh, sorry, St. Francis Xavier University on a methane uh, characterization and quantification study, uh, where they're uh, trying to identify the different sources and uh, methane in the region, whether it's landfills, upstream, oil and gas wetlands, and to understand, the, the better understand their contribution to uh, methane in the region. Uh, that image is a, is a picture of one of our air quality health index lanterns that is located in the Cold Lake Energy Center, uh, and the, the bulbs change color according to the uh, AQHI values. That's my last slide. This is a picture of our staff and some of our contact, um, contact information. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael. That was a great presentation. And I, I learned so much more about Leica. So very much appreciate that. We are both airsheds, but uh, you know, Leica is up to a lot, a lot of other things too, with your acid deposition program and, and all of that. So thank you for sharing that. I invite all of our panelists to turn on their cameras. We have a short Q&A session uh, available to us. I think probably time for about three questions if we're pretty quick, uh, wanting to be mindful of everybody's time. So if you have been listening to this webinar, have a question, please get it into that Q&A uh, box on the double. All right. The first question that I have written down is for patients around those three big buckets that you identified, the transportation, the industry, and the buildings. And it sounds like there was a lot of excitement generated around the report and the study that was undertaken um, through UBC and those students. So if you were to draw sort of your, your future vision or what you hope comes out of it in terms of that collaboration with government and those actions, you know, what, what would you share with us? Oh, gosh, that's such a big question. I guess, really, I think, well, the, oh. <laughs> there's a lot there. I think the big thing really is, is it, it triggers that, like, the, sometimes we can be thinking about something quite narrowly. Whereas if we just back up a little bit, and we think about, if we do one action, what its impacts on other things might be, and, and really looking at things a little bit more holistically and looking for those things where you'll make a positive impact in multiple areas. And it might be, it might be uh, reduction of, of greenhouse gas emissions, which is improving air quality. And it might also be tied to soil or water. I mean, who knows? I think that's the big one. And we really want, we, we really want that study to be driving some of the way that our local government thinks about how, and not just be driven, you know, for development or something, but also going, okay, that project's great, but what else, how, how are you going to incorporate that green component to what you're doing and, and, and maximizing um, that benefit to our airshed. So I think I think that I don't know if that really describes it or not. But it, they did, you guys. It, it's an immense amount of work that they did, and they uncovered. You know, they started with close to six hundred actions, and they distilled it down into these ten big moves. And there's still a lot of example actions and stuff there. So it's really drawing those entities back to, oh yeah, we had that in a plan. So let's do something about it. So anyway, yeah. Well, thanks for taking a stab at that really big question. But I always <laughs> like to be a bit aspirational here, right? Yeah. We're talking I, about our, our future and in our environment, right? Yep. Yeah. And I think that that project was really aimed at being aspirational. Yes, it started because we needed funding and everything was wrapped in a climate envelope, but it expanded to be so much more. So, yeah. Thanks. Wonderful. Okay, thanks. Next question is for Christine. I'm I'm a bit curious, um, and I don't know if you have the answer to this today. If not, I've got another backup question. But you spoke a lot about the importance of that community engagement and working really in partnership with the Strathcona Residents Association and going to those events on a regular basis with the booth, talking about the study. 
Um, what were some of the most common questions that you would get from community members as they would visit your booth and, and talk about the study? Yeah, um, I mean, I, 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 I can come up with a few, but there was quite a few of us that were manning the booth, so I don't necessarily have all of them off the top of my head. A lot of people just wanted to understand why the study was being done. Um, were the results, had we gotten the results yet? Um, you know, they re they were they were really curious to see what the study was finding. Um, they were interested to know where the monitors were located, um, and to to an extent, a little bit about the monitors because we actually brought um, Purple Air and a Clarity monitor to the events and had them connected up to the computers. They were kind of measuring air quality where we were at the event at the time, and people could see that in real time. So that that was gathered a lot of interest too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and then Michael, just wondering, you know, with that Bonneville project, and you discovered some things about the lake, and you discovered some things about the lagoon. And at the end of the day, you know, what was the community's reaction? And did mm -hmm. anything, was there any, did it spur on any further conversations? <laughs> or it was just an explanation? Oh, now we know what's going on. Um. Jesse Lake uh, sucked up a lot of our time, um, so I didn't. I had some notes. I just and I, I but I didn't. I get to talk about them. But there was actually a bit of a management response because if you remember, the other side of our organization is a watershed. Uh, so there were a number of different things that they uh, that they tried to do to improve the situation. So, for example. Um, some of that floating vegetation, the shore wash floating vegetation, was removed from the was removed by, from the from the from the lake by the town of Bonneville to remove some of the nutrients from that system that's driving the the algae bloom and the the, the odor problem. Uh, Lyca um, planted thousands of trees around the the lake and 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 whatnot to try and uptake some of that uh, the the phosphorus again and and the different nutrients that are um, driving that. Uh, the the issue uh, unfortunately what happened is a lot of those trees were planted we had very, several wet years in a row um and the level of the lake rose so a number of those a lot, a lot of the willow trees that were planted would end up becoming submerged vegetation as well uh, it's a challenge um um however you know since the level of the lake has has risen uh the odor issue hasn't uh, hasn't been as bad uh but that's you know um that's not something we can we can control Leica also investigated aeration of the lake uh and uh but it, it turned out to be kind of not a feasible um and potentially very expensive uh, expensive thing uh so i think little changes um and and awareness of the issue hopefully uh lead to some positive uh some positive outcomes and, and just in terms of what we found we found, yes, there were exceedances of the guidelines. The guideline is based on an order nuisance potential. So, you know, it's 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 going to be, it's there. People are going to smell it. Some people might be annoyed by it, but it's below kind of occupational health and safety guidelines or, or sorry, not OHNS, but guidelines or levels that cause a health concern. Um, um, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that explanation. Yeah. And, and again, hearing okay we try and take a a step to improve something but then something comes up and we have to adapt or learn yeah. or and yeah. and you know i heard some of that in in christine's presentation as well around the monitors or around mm -hmm. um you know trying to move forward and figuring out how to do this monitoring how to get the information out there um i want to say a huge thank you to all three of you for presenting today um it's great to hear what's happening in different pockets of the country and to to hear different ways that communities being engaged different ways that data is being reported or visualized and different methodologies that are being tried so Thank you very much for that. And I'd also like to uh, give a quick shout out to Russ Miyagawa, who has been on the back end of things to help provide technical support to this webinar. And uh, so with that, I wish everybody a wonderful day. Please uh, feel free to check back at Capital Airshed and we'll have links to uh, the studies and other things that uh, the presenters were touching on today. Thanks.